Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're very welcome to the Sans Culturel Irlandais and to this evening's conversation, which uh, precedes the opening of our exhibition by Roseanne Lynch. Um, and the opening will take place after the conversation at half past six. And we will also have an after party to which you are invited with uh, Elaine May that will take place in this room. We also have a pop-up gallery um, on uh, Rue Laumont, Neuf uh, Rue Laumont in Espace Laumont. And there we will show work by Ashling McCoy and Shane Lynham. So please do go along and see those exhibitions as well. Um, and this exhibition is, is part of a, a long and fruitful and beautiful conversation with Roseanne, who first um, did a residency in the Centre Culturel Irlandais in 2011, um, and that was in association with the Alliance Française in Dublin. And then later came back to us in 2014 for a further residency. And in 2015, uh, with an installation as part of a curated programme on visual perception. So it has been a great pleasure to work with Roseanne on this show um, and, um, and indeed this show will tour to the Irish Embassy in Berlin under the auspices of the Centre Culturel Irlandais. And this evening Roseanne will be in conversation with Peggy Sue Amason, highly regarded photography curator, um, who is also a long-term friend of the Centre Culturel. And I will hand over to you now, Peggy Sue, and thank you both and congratulations. So thank you all for coming out this evening um, a little bit early before you s before it gets late. Um, no, it's really lovely to have you all here, and I, I want to take a minute and thank the uh, San Cultural Irlandes for having me here and inviting me to curate this show with Roseanne. We've known each other for quite a long time, but we've never worked together. I might also like to thank Culture Ireland and the Irish Arts Council and the Embassy of Ireland for their support of um, Roseanne's work and her project. Uh, so we were just going to start. I after we have the talk, I really invite you all to go back and spend some time with the work because you're going to come back with much more information after we, we finish this chat, just to give you a little bit more background on what is drawing the work. And I think you'll find a lot of subtleties there that you may not have noticed the first time going through. So um, I wanted to just ask Roseanne what actually, because this is drawn, this exhibition is drawn out of a uh, residency that she had in um, the Bauhaus for the last just a little bit over a year, is it now? The residency is three months, but I still don't know the name of it. Yeah. You should. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're not used to these yeah. things. Um, no, so I just wanted her to tell you a little bit about what, where you started and how you came to the Bauhaus, what, what drew you there. But first, let's talk about your practice a little bit kind of some of your early work. We're going to show these slides and then we'll bring the lights back up again. Um, at the end of this talk, we'll have some time for questions and answers too. So Easy ones. <laughs> <laughs> so can you just talk a little bit about, talk a little bit about your practice, what yeah. drew you to the Bauhaus and how you ended up where you are now? Okay, so I'll start with, well, thank you very much. And it's just so nice because I'm talking to my friends. Like the first two rows are all people I've known for a long time. Thank you very much. Um, um, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start 2010 when I did my masters because I think I think because I'm very old, so there's a lot before that. But um, I, this image was made for. Um, do the lights need to come down a bit? Thank you. Uh, this image was made for my masters in Crawford in Cork, which is when my education. I went to uh, photography college to, to um, in Edinburgh. Um, so I'm a technical, I was taught to be a technical photographer, to be a jobbing photographer. Um, and that, but that was a long time ago, a lot has happened since, and it was really my masters in Crawford, the fabulous Crawford in Cork, that um, launched me into this uh, very happy encounter with my own thoughts and life and stuff. So this work I made in the Crawford College, and what I was doing was I was making constructs to hold light. So uh, this is a metal ducting for air conditioning and uh, the light is behind it. And I was looking through a five by four camera, putting my head under the cloth, looking into this thing that didn't look like it was in reality because you're looking on a two, you're looking on the screen 
your head is under the cloth. Um, and I was dragging students in off the corridor saying, look at this, look, there it is, and this is what it looks like. And it just completely thrilled me. Um, so I started all these questions. I didn't have the answers, and I still don't have the answers. And I'm still curious, and I'm still, once I know the answers, I'm, I kind of lose interest. So this was 2010, uh, Master's show, called a body of work called Document, which um, got me the, a res the original award and the residency here. This is in Eileen Gray's house. It's uh, underneath the spiral staircase looking up Can towards the light. Can you explain who Eileen Gray is? Because some people Eileen may not Gray know. Eileen Gray was a Irish architect who, um, um, how do you even talk? Uh, well, she's a fabulous woman. She, uh, she was part of the mod modernist movement. She was part of the Irish, uh, the sh part of the modernist movement. She built a house called E1027 in the south of France, a place called Rockborough Cap Martin. Um, which fell into disrepair and a whole lot of other stories. There's a lot of stories around her, but ultimately it is now restored, you probably know that, um, and it is a place you can visit. It's, she built it as a place for her and her lover to live and to experience light and the sea um, and a, there's a lot more to Eileen Gray and a lot of controversial stuff and a lot of fun in the story. Anyway, I did a tour. You stand on the carpet, you don't stand on the carpet. You have to stay in a line. You have to touch, you have not to touch. And I was just fascinated with the light. These spaces are places to hold light. That's what I was looking at. at so before. this is from that? This is from Eileen Gray's house, a body of work called Eloquent Crew, which is a term from a, math a research mathematician who I had a conversation with on that residency in Cassis in the south of France. Uh, a research mathematician uses very similar language to a re an artist who's researching. We talk about refining, we talk about beauty, we talk about uh, a transformation from this sentence to this sentence. And we talk about uh, this transformation in a way, in language that refers to hearing, but visual art is visual. Th these beautiful crossovers. But there are often times in, specifically in photography, where I feel like I can hear what's, I can hear the image. It's yeah. There's something about that materiality of it. There's something about that. The one thing I find really interesting about Roseanne's work is that she's working on a 2D surface, but she gives you this impression of three dimensions, which I think is really, um, it's a really powerful statement. And it's something that evokes emotions in us, even though it's not a, the way we imagine a photograph. I mean, most of us, when we imagine photographs, we imagine compositions where there is something that we can identify with that it relates to our you know, everyday life. Where when you look at Roseanne's work, you get a much more, uh, you get a deeper sense of how photography can work in terms of its intrinsic nature of materialism. I'm interested in what photography does. And always I start with a question, if I'm in somewhere, I'm saying, what could a photograph I make here do? I'm not really interested in showing you somewhere you're not. Uh, it's something else that I'm interested in. Um, do you think it's more uh, sort of emotion related? I would say it's very emotional. I'd right. say so I'm it's led by my emotions. Sort of ineffable. It's something yeah. that doesn't have words. Yeah, which is kind of difficult when you're talking about it. Um, um, there's um, an architect. Um, Johanny, Johannes Palam, Palasma, I know I get that word wrong. Johanny Palasma wrote a book called The Eye of the Skin. And it's, it's fantastic when you read something that somebody else who you think a lot of has written and you, it explains the way you think, which you kind of disregard it because that's the way you think and you've always thought like that. And then you read somebody like him and um, it just, you're part of a greater conversation. He talks about um, the ocular and how we think our eyes are the top dog. They're the most important sense because without them, we can't see, blah, 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 all these things we can't do. However, if you, um, I can't paraphrase, but I'll tell you what I understand what he's saying. I was in Leipzig, there's great music going on in the concert halls. Uh, you get very cheap tickets, if you, you know, and you're off in the gods, but the gods are fabulous. Um, and I'm there listening to this music and I'm closing my eyes and I got so emotional I thought I was going to cry. So I opened my eyes to break the connection. So if your eyes are open, we are breaking the connection somehow with ourselves. There's something going on there, which is a bit of a problem if you're a photographer. So um, 
but these are the kind of things like when we were when we were when you were arranging the work inside we were talking about rhythm and it is an auditory thing there's a do 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 because some of the work is high pitch some of it's low yeah, and I mean, I think that's something that Ansel Adams talked about a lot. He said the negative is the score and the print yeah. is the music. Yeah. Um, and I think that you can really feel that. I know the one thing that you should know about the work in the exhibition is aside from the two images, the one where you enter, that's quite big, and the one of the corner, all the rest of them are unique images. You cannot remake them. They were made in the dark room as photograms. So that's kind of, I mean, that's why I wanted her to talk a little bit about what led her to the Bauhaus because she's been working with this practice for quite a long time, which is some of the earliest ways that artists worked with uh, photography. They experimented with light by putting uh, image uh, objects on light reflective paper and then exposing them and then putting them into the chemistry to see what came out of it. So she is not really controlling the way that when we make a picture and we look through the camera, we go, oh, well, could you move a little bit that way or this way? You can't do that when you're making a photogram because you don't really know how it's going to be until you put it into the developer. Which brings me back to my enjoyment of not knowing. I like I like not knowing. I stand in Bel Derek, Acacia Fields, um, um, on a little residency a long time ago, and the, the plates of the planet collide. So I don't know if you know down to the coast, so you have these where the rocks collide and you've got big curves and everything. And um, I was fascinated, did a body of work on it. But then this archaeologist started, was killed to tell me all about it. And I was kind of, la, la, la. I couldn't, he was talking to me. I don't want to understand it because then I don't, I'm not interested anymore. Anyway, I'll go on to another, I'm digressing. Um, another image, this was made in Maison de Vere, which is here in Paris. Um, it is a beautiful house, architectural, modernist, uh, of importance. My interest was not in showing you, do the lights need to go down again, are we okay? You get the idea. Um, the, this is a room divider made of three sheets of aluminium. So as they move, the tone changes. So I'm, I'm not been very helpful if you're interested in Maison de Vere. But so what, in, what I'm interested in is surface and just tone on tone like a jazz, there was a jazz double bass player in the Bach Festival in Leipzig, and he was there with his eyes closed, strumming away, no, narra no nar narrative, just tone and tone. And I was thinking, I don't have a lot in common with jazz, but I was looking at that guy thinking, you're doing the same thing I'm doing, just tone on tone. And this is the last image of these, and then we put the lights back up again. Um, so this is a photogram. These are objects placed on the photographic paper a light shone through and uh, you are shown something that doesn't exist. It doesn't look like that in real life. It never looked like that. This was a body of work called Exposures. I made them just after I had an operation on my back and I was part of a show and I wanted to make new work. And in the downstairs toilet with the ironing board as a table, I exposed these little squares of acetate, which you put in the enlarger to control the tone the contrast of the image. So building little houses, little house of cards like, and you'd uh, throw the flash, a, a torch across it, and this is the shadow of those objects. So where it's sharp, the object is touching the paper, and as it goes out of focus, it's away from the paper, so it gives this idea of depth, and so often they would collapse before the exposure, and they are very fragile, and you can't, you can, even if you like one, and then you try and do it again, it's different. And it was, um, I mean, not all work, I suppose, autobiographical, but I was very fragile at that time. And I could only stand up for 20 minutes, and then I'd have to sit down on the toilet, in the toilet, in the dark room. And um, so these things were, I kind of liked them. And they're only small, they're only this size, because I couldn't process any bigger. So that's, I think they were one of my first photograms, which brought me to this process of photograms. So, um, so when I asked her, so the lights can come up now, please. <laughs> so when I asked her, um, I was talking to Roseanne today, and I said, "What is it that brought you to the Bauhaus?" And I thought she would name artists, and instead she talked about the way that she had been interpreting light over this period of time and the importance of that to her, um, and how she wanted to uh, think about spaces, how how spaces hold light. I'm only interested in architecture as holders of light 
and it's minimalism because in, in minimalist buildings you have a wall meets a wall and there's no, you know, the ceiling, there's no cornicing to distract you from pure tone. That's my interest. It's not, um, and, and people, especially when I've had a residency in Bauhaus, they expect me to be some kind of expert on Bauhaus and I'm not. I'm interested in the, I'm interested in how light occupies these spaces and what a photograph I can do, I can make in that space will do. Like the, there's one, only one made the cut. There's a whole load of work from this last while, which uh, very healthily hasn't made it into the show. Um, except the one on the wall, the one on the gray wall, when you're in the space and you look back, um, that's the one image made by a negative in the space, which is kind of mad because that's what I do. I make images from negatives. Well, and I also think it's it's quite interesting the the thing you were saying to me about how when you first got there you were focusing on the architecture, thinking that you were going to make work about the architecture, yeah. and instead you got into the archives. Because Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yep, yeah, I was, um, I was, as you say, but I've never really heard it so strongly s that I am led by emotion. I was looking for the emotion of Bauhaus, the energy of Bauhaus, and I wanted to. Uh, well, when you go there, in Dessau, Dessau is where Gropius designed his, the, the studio buildings that you recognize and the master's houses, whereas in Weimar they went, uh, they were in a building that was already there. Um, and they went on to Berlin afterwards. But in, Gro in Dessau, which is only 45 minutes on a train from Leipzig, where I live, which is why I live there, um, the, uh, everything you touch is reproduced. Uh, rep uh, it's re rebuilt because it was bombed during the war. It was occupied. It was uh, the, the materials that made it are um, experimental, and mostly they failed fabulously. Um, so I was in search of the authentic. So I ended up in the archive. Um, can I tell the story? Uh, can I tell? But how no. I <laughs> uh, so Torsten Bluma is. Um, I was going to Dessau. I went, sorry, and this is not linear. I was at Berlin Biennale with my pals, Cordrick and Cass, on a Cork Arts Council. Sorry, yep. I'm diverting. Um, You're fine, go ahead. <laughs> and we were there for seven days, and it's a bit of a head wreck. Like, so much art, I can't take it. So I took a day off, and I got on a bus down to Dessau. And I went in, and I just thought, I have to come back here. This place completely excites me more than the art did in the Berlin Biennale. Um, so I got a, a, a residency uh, to go back, Cork Arts Council, I think that was, um, to go back for two weeks to stay in Dessau. So I'm there with my idea of I'm going to photograph the interiors of, of the buildings, which I did. And I'm in the um, I'm in the bistro every morning and every night because there's nowhere else to eat. And this fellow shuffles over um, one day and he says to me, uh, you're always in here, like, what are you doing? Because I'm there with, like, a nerd with my book and my notebook and um, my glass of wine. And uh, he says, you're always in here, what are you doing? Are you researching or what? And he s and I said, I'm, this is what I'm doing. So he says, what are you reading? And I said, I'm reading this old magazine, years out of date, bought in a second-hand shop. And he says, what article are you reading? And I said, oh, this one. And he says, I wrote it. <laughs> and um, that has kind of been my life. I'm so lucky, um, stuff just happens like that. So he said, can I have a coffee with you? And we got on famously. I happen to have my portfolio with me, as you do. So uh, he wanted to see it. And then I was telling him my problem with Bauhaus and that I couldn't touch anything that was authentic. And he said, I'm going out for a cigarette. Go get your portfolio. We'll meet down in my office. And all of this um, energy that I was looking for in Bauhaus, all of this energy, there's no other word for it, is on his desk because it's a big mess. It's a big mess of fabulousness whereas everywhere else is tidy. And uh, like now it's a hotel, you can go and stay there. There's not, a, you know, in this building, there's none of this um, energetic, creative madness it which I was looking for. It makes me think about when I went to Lee Miller's house the first time and I just wanted to touch everything because yeah. everyone had been there, Picasso and Max Ernst and everybody. And you would go down the, like I remember walking down the stairway and just like wanting to touch it all. and. But th all of that had been left as is. I think that I can completely understand why you wouldn't connect with a place that's been sanitized. It's fabulous. I mean, I'm not, it is a beautiful place to be in, but it wasn't what I was looking for. 
at least when I looked at the images, I was thinking, I've seen them before. But there's yeah. something, y you were talking to me today when I was talking to you about, uh, again, about what have has moved you in the past, like what sort of artworks have moved you in the past. And you talked about Huey O'Donnell, Donahue, Donahue yeah. and also Lee Ufan. Yeah. And the thing that you told me was that what you really loved about those pieces was that they had painted and then they had scraped back and repainted and scraped back. And I think that through that, um, you know, there's this energy that you feel when you look at an image like that, when, a, when you can really feel the brush strokes. It's like when you look at a Van Gogh and you see the depth of the paint, you yeah. see the emotion. And something of the human, maybe, who made it. Like the Huey who I was in the lift in Glucksman. There's a huge big lift, and it's very slow because it brings the artwork up and down. And I was only me and Huey who not in a lower. It's, it's owned by the UCC collection. It's huge. Uh, Nora, not in a lower. Huey O'Donoghue who's not in a lower. It's part of the UCC. Nora, uh, we were both working on the same thing. We were working researching at the time. And um, I was just moved by this layers and colours and that stuff. And I think that reads back into your work and that you make these constructions by hand. You, you, you look to see how light bends and how it shapes. Mm -hmm. I mean, light travels at a speed, and I think that's something that we always forget, that light is a moving, you know, uh, it's like a moving organic substance, mm. you know, and in waves and, and rays. And you actually play with that and you move that in the same way that these artists have taken back the layers of paint. Yeah. You're, you're forming, you're playing with, your sc you're sculpting with light. Because I don't really understand it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's again that yeah. goes back to the emotional in that yeah. you're using it to speak a language, to reflect, you know, your curiosity. Yeah, to explain it to myself, really. Um, and part of the Bauhaus, um, w I went in, did maid work in the archive then. So I have these pictures of uh, the brick, the hollowed out brick that Gropius designed, which was lightweight, which meant that the pillars could be taller, which means they could do the glass walls, okay? So technical, fabulous experimentation. Um, and so they're on pallets in this archive that you're not allowed into. I was. But um, it just, it, it, and it was, look, I think it was because I'm a woman of my age that I was let in. Um, I think you were really polite too. I was polite too, and I liked the woman. And I had, an, I had um, Source Magazine, the Irish, um, Source mags, photography Photograph. magazine. I had a portfolio in that which I could send on, and Monica Marcraft saw my work in the magazine and saw, it, and it was it was eloquent pr proof. And um, those thi those like things ma help you along, but um, so these things, this palettes of this grumpy old bricks is fundamentally Bauhaus and looks nothing like Bauhaus, and that kind of excited me. You but mean it, it looks nothing like Bauhaus today? Yeah, because it's, it, it's not minimal. It's um, brick, mm -hmm. old stuff. And there's um, buckets of the bomb debris from Moholy Nage, between Moholy Nage and Gropius House. So, like, all this stuff is not minimal. But um, those pick now, Hans Ball is here. And I went on a, there he is. He's, um, he's a, a, a much respected photographer, nerd like myself, when it comes to darkroom stuff. And I went and I did a workshop, funded as, again by Cork, um, in the in the Netherlands, and he is even more nerdy than I am about the darkroom. Pyro, this developer that Ansel Adams used to use, that you can't import into Germany because it's dangerous that it gets sent to my parents' house. So then I bring it back in that way. Um, but it's it's um, the secrets so you out. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, stop you at the border. You expose for the shadows, and you develop for the highlights, and you use this pyro developer, which does a very particular thing, and. Um, is it explosive? No, it's not explosive. It just kind of is, it makes you sick. Isn't that the thing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's why. It's yeah. just toxic. Yeah, it is a bit toxic. Yeah. But um, I use a mask. My daughter does use a mask. I use gloves. Um, but so I have all these beautiful images of this beautiful stuff. And Monica let me into her office then. And I photographed her favorite Bauhaus objects, like broken glass blocks and old handles and stuff. And. Um, I was looking at these beautiful images. I sleep in my studio, so like I literally live with the work. I have magnetic strips on the wall, and I put the work up on magnets. And I'm looking at it and thinking, I love you, but you're just not doing it for me. Like you're showing me 
information, but you're not really talking about emotion. Like, yeah, or emotion. I had to get those that stuff out of the way. And as I was making that work, I was um, the I work in the Leipzig Darkroom, the Art Academy in Leipzig. I'm a guest, uh, which is lovely. I do a few hours teaching, and then I'm allowed to use their darkroom. And um, it's a very big darkroom, so I could be making my sensible work over here. And over here, I'm exposing little bits of paper and having fun and folding stuff and using my camera phone to light it. And it just, they'd be on my, like, so I'd wake up and I'd be looking at all this stuff on the wall. And I'm kind of thinking, I'm going off you. I really like you. Mm -hmm. And that's the way the conversation. But it's really interesting to me because, you know, you're working in the Bauhaus. And Paul Clay was part of the Bauhaus yeah. at one point. And one of the things that Paul Clay said, which is a, something that I, I th I'm sure I've said this to you before, um, that he felt that artists had to learn the foundation of their craft until it became second nature. And once they did that, then they could go to the stars. If they tried to do something cubist or modernist in any way without knowing their foundation mm. as second nature, then it wouldn't, they had built a house without a foundation, basically yeah. it would fall over. And he felt there was this world between what we know, what we're taught to know, and what is, and that he felt that world was only accessible to children, madmen, and artists, that children are brought up in mm. this world, and they're taught out of it, that uh, madmen fall into it and can't get out of it, and that um, artists, he felt, could go in, travel through, and come out with a document. And when you describe the difference between photographing what we would expect, mm -hmm. you know, like, walls and buildings and bricks and Stuff. and uh -huh. ephemera, you know, and how that was sort of boring to you. That makes sense to me because you had to build that you had to build that foundation yeah. before you could realize. And I, I mean a lot of times when you're on a residency, and we've discussed this a bit this week, a lot of times when you're on a residency, you don't really know why you're there. You're there to get some space and to have some thinking time and some breathing space. And then something magic happens in the midst of boredom and not knowing exactly what the heck you're doing, suddenly you get enlightenment. And it can happen, you know, in the middle of the residency, at the end of the residency, or the day before you leave. Um, it's just, I think it, it's, it's this time of allowing yourself to play mm -hmm. and let your mind relax and open to other possibilities. And I think that's what happened to you. Which that's what it sounds like. Which is the luxury like. of being on an extended time in a place where all you're doing is making this work. You know, I wasn't, um, I took a career break for one year and then a second year from Crawford where I teach. And uh, because I, I was offered this show when I was still working as te you know, teaching and you'd fit in your work in between. And I get really tired. I Teaching, I find, I love teaching. I actually miss teaching at the minute, but I uh, it takes a lot, my creative, thing is satisfied in teaching so then you don't really have that energy to or time to fail you know to do the stuff to get it out of the way and um, Miles McGoffrey says I don't know what I think until I read what I wrote I'm not sure if that's correct but that's kind of what he said um, and I think that's a lot of what I've been doing you know I was looking at my the stuff I was really enjoying and then I was looking at it and eventually I was saying actually that's what I'm about. This other work isn't so much. It's I, I'm not dishing it. It's beautiful, but it's um, the energy was over here. And you may side. find that later you come back to that. I, I'm happy work. to come back to it, and I, I would stand over the other work, and I hope it'll be shown, but not here. But I think what you describe this idea of practicing and making and not really understanding what it is that you're doing. You're just going with a feeling, yeah, and then one day after some time passes, you look back and you understand where that fits in your life and yes. where that fits with your personality. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't know. It's it's really like fumbling around in the dark and you know it's working because you feel right with it. You feel. But you don't yeah. really understand it until you yeah. get space from it. And then suddenly one day you look at it and you go, I know what that's about now, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's just, I think that's what's really beautiful about art is that you and and write. I mean, any form of art, making music, writing, is that it, as you say, sometimes you're writing and you don't really know what you're writing about, and then suddenly you look back at it and you go, "Oh, okay, I was working out this thing," mm -hmm. you know. But that doesn't. It's not always evident in the beginning, and I think that's what makes the power of this work is that it does feel like it's this very intuitive process that you're 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 experimenting, and through that experimentation, you're you're making these 
I mean, the gradients in the prints are quite amazing. And again, I go back to the fact that they are quite three-dimensional in a very two-dimensional space. And I think that's where the power lies. You get this really, it's real sense of texture. And I don't mean like um, the way we think of texture on a wall. It's, it's this more like this um, psychological texture and tension that you, that you intuit when you look at the work. This transformation from the 3D to the 2D surface of a photograph has interested me for so, so long. And photography's failure, what is termed photography's failure, uh, is photography is always completely true to itself. Photography doesn't fail. Our expectations of what photography does is out of line. That's what I've always felt. That uh, here I was those, you know, I was at a party or I had a sunset. Here's the photo. I expect you to understand what it felt like to be there. And you don't, especially sunset. Sunsets are the worst. Uh, or, or any of these pl places where you engage with emotion. Um, and so I've slowly and slowly getting re re refining, I suppose, the things that I'm not so interested in and bringing it back to what I'm actually, what am I actually talking about? What am I actually really concerned with? And architecture has always been there. I'm not, you know, it did kind of this architecture thing. My grandfather was an engineer. My son is an engineer. Architects and engineers seem to go in uh, every other generation. Is it something like that uh, you were saying last night? Um, that uh, some kind of interest in, I'm not interested in how a building functions, but this interest in, ar in architecture is really strong. And this, um, the construct then that the paper becomes, if you can fold the paper, if you, like the, the ultimately I started read, I went to the library in Bauhaus in Dessau. The woman, Catherine, who runs it is a great Rory Gallagher fan. So she'd let me um, uh, photocopy You're not books. from Cork at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not from Cork, no. But uh, I know Rory Gallagher because my brother and uh, would have respect for Rory Gallagher. And um, also he's buried just beside where I lived in Cork. And uh, this woman, Catherine, had been to the graveyard. So we had a great bonding session. So she'd allow me photocopy books. And I, uh, a new book came out, The Teachings of Bauhaus. And I just suddenly was reading this. What were they trying to do? What was Bauhaus set up for? It was um, not about product design. It was not about making loads of stuff and having a, dis a, 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 a brand that goes international. It was set up or thought through by Gropius after First World War because he was fragmented, because he was suffering, and he believed in art as a way to heal. So he and other people, and he never said it was his own idea. He, um, I learned in that book, uh, he brought people together who would workshop ideas, who were curious, and it was artists who were teaching. And he, he was saying uh, things that, ha what has happened now is I've applied my practice to this way of thinking. This only happened a while ago. Um, so um, experimentation, knowing, this body of work is called grammar. And he was talking about the grammar of your materials. So to understand very few materials and uh, the shapes, the square, the circle, the triangle, and the straight line. Um, to, isn't it Morandi who painted um, just, he spent his whole life painting just the, a few ceramic objects in his studio. And um, this idea of refining and just really bringing it back down to very uh, basic elements. And that completely opens you up to, I can do loads. If I can choose from the whole world, where do I start? But if you bring things back to very few elements, it's much more playful. And failure is a huge big part of it. And thanks to the Arts Council, I had a big box of paper. So, and I had time. And thanks to Trish Brennan, who let me off from college for a second year, um, and to Darren, who fabulously teaches my students, and um, not my students, they're not my students, but uh, when you really care about teaching, you're kind of, it matters leaving photography in Crawford, and between Podrick and, and Darren, I'm so happy, I think they're much, I think they're actually really benefiting from me not being there, <laughs> and they'll benefit when I go back, but um, you know, I'm really, all of these things really matter when you've kind of left things like that matter. But coming back to your practice, Sorry, yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> that it's really, I think one of the things that we talked about is that you brought everything back so far 
sort of like you, you, you took away everything yeah. to forget and then to remember. Yeah. Sort of remember seeing from the very basics. You know, by removing all the all the extra yeah. and, and only limiting yourself to the very bare minimum, then you start to remember this this sensation of looking. What was I looking at at the start before it all got complicated? And how yeah. how light plays yeah. into that. And I, I, because I asked you this morning, like, you know, do it seems like light really, um, really informs everything you do because I've never seen you make an image that where light wasn't the main, mm -hmm. um, wasn't the, the focus. Um, and you were telling me that when you were young, you used to just watch the light pass. That and was private. <laughs> I'm really joking. No, I would daydream. Like, uh, okay. Well, but I sure, think but I sure, we all. Really I mean, but that goes back to that idea of the world that <laughs> you are, you you grow up in. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah. in when we're young, we have a sense of wonder, and we're learning to see, and we're learning the different elements of sight. I'm not joking. And yeah. a lot of us, and a lot of us forget those. Yeah. Forget that we get too busy. We are doing yeah. a million things. We don't contemplate light anymore the yeah. way that your work contemplates light and I think that goes all the way back I, I think to I really childhood think it does, when you just when you're a child and you're allowed to be bored and you just look at light and you're thinking you're not thinking anything you're just looking and um, daydreaming the power like the beauty of daydreaming and doodling I really I'm a big fan of both um, and just it gets complicated as you get more educated and this idea of just going well, back. Well, life gets more complicated. Yeah, so yeah. suddenly you don't have time to just uh, enjoy looking, which is what I think a lot of your work does as well. It allows people to just stare at something for a long period of time and let things come to them. I mean, if you've gone through the show, I, you know, again, I highly recommend that you go back and spend time with those images because edges and shapes come forward that you don't notice the first time around. I, and I did want you to talk about Nina's room as well, because mm. I think that's really important. The large image on the gray wall, which is just a corner of a room, um, which is probably the only thing that you can probably recognize as, as something as familiar. Place, yeah. um, do you want to talk about Nina's room a little bit and why you took that picture? Well, it, I took it because it was a corner, and this is what I look at. I look at corners. Uh, historically, I look at corners where not much happens, but just where tones are defined by the planes of wall. Um, but I particularly like Nina's room because uh, the, con the, the Kandinsky's, Nina and Wals Wasley Kandinsky, lived in the master's houses in Dessau. And um, I was on, it's just been renovated, and uh, I was on a tour, and the woman said that this is Frau Kandinsky's studio. Uh, and I said, oh, so she was an artist as well. Like Bauhaus wouldn't be big on promoting their women at that time anyway. And um, there was silver in the paint, little flecks of silver. And I really, uh, so I was, kind of, I was really interested in this room, particularly in the house. And I said, oh, what's, what's her first name? And I was told Frau. <laughs> so, um, so I kind of got my heckles up. So Nina is her first name. And then I was kind of, me and Nina are going to promote Nina. Um, but that, I don't know why that work, why that picture does what it does. It does, okay. Uh, it does a funny thing. The other thing I, I wanted you to talk about, because the, the one thing that's really beautiful about the way that a lot of us work when we're on residency is we want to bring our friends because we're having such a great experience. So you've been able to make some incredible connections for the Crawford, and I'd like yeah. you to talk about that a little well, bit. Well, this guy, Torsten Blume, uh, so he, Bauhaus 100, there was a festival coming up uh, of dance. So Torsten is, um, the, the stage in Bauhaus is, is uh, his arena. And so we, we brought him over to Cork for a, for a workshop with students. And what eventually happened anyway was that these, yeah, he came, uh, we were dancing with paper. Yeah, so Torsten Blumer says, um, he sits me down and he says, um, dance, contemporary dance. And I'm thinking, okay, don't get it. And uh, our movement or something, he used some kind of language that I thought, no, no idea what you're talking about. And he took a bit of A4 A4 paper and he crunched it up and he put it on the table and he says, What do you see? And I'm thinking, crunched up A4 paper. And then he jumps up and he starts to he's not here, is he? 
<laughs> and then he, uh, so he starts to imitate with his body the shape of the shadow in the middle of this thing. And I'm thinking, oh my God, yeah. And so it completely broke down. Um, and this is the workshop that he did with students. So the students then came over to Bauhaus to Dessau in September um, with Trish and uh, 12, how many students? Eight students had this engagement with your man from Bauhaus and they performed as part of the uh, the opening of um, Bauhaus, the uh, museum there. Big deal. And the guys were amazing. And so this is a beautiful thing. But before we finish, can I just... It was just, and it was a huge experience for them as well, that they were actually, the students actually got to engage in, a, in an activity that was connected to the Bauhaus. And the fact that it came through your residency, I think is really beautiful because I think a lot of us, when we've been in residencies or run residencies, we really want to see that kind of engagement and that kind of growth so that um, we have our practice or we, like I ran a residency for 14 years in Cove, where you know we would bring artists to our area and be thrilled that they were making work there, but if then that could grow and gr you know make more connections and become a bigger thing, I mean the experience for those young people must have been amazing. But in fairness, if you heard Torsten talking, you have to share it. Do you know the way he well talks? That's about what stuff? I mean. Yeah, yeah. and so it's brilliant that you're able to do yeah. that. Well, that's Trish uh, saying yes to ideas. Yeah, but it, it it spurred yeah, out of yeah, the residency yeah. and the fact that you and met him and you yeah. suggested it. Yeah. So that that is an amazing Cork thing. Cork is a big seller. Ireland, Bin Irish is a big seller. Do you know, people want to visit Ireland. People are very curious about Ireland. Yeah. I always found so that, especially you know, with photography. Yep. Yeah, so we're we're very lucky that this is our identity. That we're something that people actually like to be involved in. It's a great help when you're trying to convince people to come to. Ireland. Well, and yeah. it goes back to the thing that I think a lot of people are aware of Ireland because of the arts, yeah. which is something we are all very proud of as Irish people, that our little tiny island has the power through our creative arts to reach people in all countries. I mean, I remember living in, in Doolin and seeing people from Sri Lanka coming over and trying to play in trad sessions. I mean, it's fantastic when that yeah. happens. Mm. That's what you want. I used to run a, a maritime festival in Cove, and we had performers coming from France, from Poland, from Brittany, and they would all sing together in the pub. And one, you know, they'd start the song in English, and then the next person would sing it in Polish, and the next person would sing it in French. And, and the locals would just be like, how do they all know the same song? <laughs> You know, but it was a trad song, so everybody knew it. But anyway, sorry, going off track here. But you said there was one more thing you wanted to yeah. say. So I just, uh, the, the paper in the, the paper that you're looking at is actually folded. So um, the, there's, I folded paper around circles, squares, and triangular forms, and then unfolded them, and they sit up like a mountain, like a structure and then throw a flashlight across them so the shadow of their own structure is recorded in Which their own gives structure. Which the three-dimensional yep. effect, right? And then you put them into the developing dish, and then if something's too white, or if you want to, you take your camera phone halfway through the developer, take the camera phone and add a bit of light, which solarizes it, and um, it brings this other dimension to it. And I just, uh, the, the other, the, the straight-folded ones, are um, architects have a if you have a big plan there's a particular fold to a big plan to get it to go into a small thing and it's it's called an architectural fold and I had the YouTube video under the under the counter and I was folding my paper on this fold and then unfolding it and shining the light across it and it's this reference back to it's not of nothing it's back reference to architecture and I'm thinking that uh, so this work the titles are untitled and there's it's like 23 3 1 which would be the 23rd of March and it's the first one I made so the reference is in the title not telling you about this elsewhere except that there was an elsewhere and I'm thinking well I'm not showing you I, in my in error, I was saying my photographs aren't about elsewhere, but of course they are. They were made elsewhere, but you're looking at them now, and it's by taking away the obvious link to the elsewhere, I am um, bringing more of an awareness to the now of looking at them. So you're looking at them, especially because you don't know maybe what you're looking at. You're thinking, you're having a conversation with yourself, which is now, 
and less about elsewhere. Yeah, and I think also that the the fact that there is no title leaves the interpretation again open to the viewer. Except Nina's, she gave her uh, hers. Well, but that was that's why I made you talk about yeah, it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and just like the first one that you come in, so I'm a diehard analog head, but it, this is a contemporary photographic practice, and so we can use anything we want and anything. Um, even though I love analog more than digital, I just don't love it. I love teaching it, but it doesn't give me the pleasure. Sitting in front of a computer doesn't give me as much pleasure. I'm not as emotionally connected. So the first image you come in at challenges me in a whole load of ways. It's not made by me. It was made in a computer by somebody else who I asked to make it, and it was not printed by me. So it's this thing of uh, if you are an architect, you, it's your building, but you didn't actually physically make it. And this happens quite a lot in art. And um, uh, Sol Lewis, uh, paint, uh, he would send the plans for his drawing over to the gallery and technicians would, um, and this was happening in Luxman when, no, or Emma when I was working there. And um, people would have, oh, the rows that you'd have in front of these works where people are saying, but that's not his work. So it is a challenge. So it's in there. And it's in the mix of this contemporary practice as a little, you know, a little stirring, a little stirring. It's just bringing up these questions. It's a, because people always say, um, you know, they, if I hate it. People call analog photography old fashioned. And I'm thinking, no, this is a completely contemporary practice because when digital come along, I think analog is released. Same as when painting came along. Sorry, when photography came along, painting was released. And I think there's more ref self-reflexive uh, work been made now about the medium of photography. And we have, we can do anything with it. We, you know, mm. it's, it's all a, f a contemporary photographic practice. Okay, so I think that's where we should leave it for now. So um, I think we'll let you go look at the show now and then you can always just speak to us in the room. So thank, thank you, you for your attention.